my name is James Nevius, and you are here for In Perspective, Small Bites of the Big Apple, number three. So this is our third installment. We do this every two to three months. Uh, big thanks to Graham Rader and Michael Foley at Rader Galleries for asking me to do this series. And what the, the point of this series is to take something that's on view at the gallery and take a, a little bit of a close look at it. And what we're going to be looking at today is the image that you see pictured. Now, I know a lot of you know me, uh, but if you don't know me, my wife Michelle and I have written a number of books about New York City, including Inside the Apple, A Streetwise History of New York City, and Footprints in New York, Tracing the Lives of Four Centuries of New Yorkers. And uh, they really delve into the history of the city from pre-European colonization to almost the, pre almost the present day. They are history books. And uh, I do, I, I am kind of fascinated by the era that we're going to be talking about today, which is the late 1840s and the early uh, to mid 1850s. And what we are looking at is this image, which is a view of Lower Manhattan, uh, painted and then later engraved. Uh, and it is, uh, the painter was named J.W. Hill, the engraver was named Henry Paprill, and it is the view of Lower Manhattan from the steeple of St. Paul's Chapel. And it exists in two states. Uh, this one that you're looking at here is 1849, and this one that you're looking at here is 1855, and we're going to go back I, I, I didn't line them up exactly. We are going to go back and forth between these two images, looking at what changed in, in what is uh, a relatively short period of time, historically in a, a, a tiny period of time, and yet so much uh, that is obvious changed. And I can't really speak to what inspired them to reissue the print, other than the fact that uh, this was becoming... Uh, what I would call the sort of the, the, the biggest intersection in New York City at the time. Uh, so without further ado, uh, if you don't know Lower Manhattan, uh, St. Paul's Chapel is on Broadway. Let me get my laser pointer out here. St. Paul's Chapel is on Broadway uh, between Vesey or Vesey Street, depending on who you ask, and Fulton Street. And so the view the main thing that you're looking down at from the chapel is that block, which today is pretty nondescript. This is this new entrance to the Fulton Street, uh, the Fulton Subway connection, where every train that goes downtown can essentially be accessed. Uh, this building is this sort of nondescript pinkish skyscraper that's been there for a number of years. Uh, St. Paul's would be just here. That's the iron fencing at St. Paul's, and if you were standing in this spot and turned around, there's St. Paul's, there's the steeple from which the view was painted, and there, of course, is one World Trade Center, and you can just see peeking out there the Oculus. So that's just to give you some perspective of what we're talking about. Now, St. Paul's is the uh, oldest remaining civic building for sure in Manhattan. It's from 1766. Uh, it is one of the few pre-revolutionary structures uh, standing in Manhattan at all. And it is, uh, you can see it here in this print from 1831. It is relatively unchanged in, uh, in all those years. Uh, this, you can just see peeking off the corner here, says Museum because uh, it's cut off, museum. And uh, we're going to talk about the museum at that corner, uh, which for many years was known as Barnum's American Museum. But actually, when this print was done, it was Scudder's Museum. Uh, Barnum had a great knack for finding things. P.T. Barnum had a great knack for finding things that he thought were going to be, um, that were going to sell. Uh, and so he didn't necessarily uh, invent things out of whole cloth. He moved in and did, he was sort of a corporate raider. He was Elon Musk. He would come in and he would buy things that he thought were successful. And then he would make them, for the most part, more successful. We'll get to him in a second. But back to our print. So this is the view from St. Paul's Chapel, 1849, looking south down Broadway. There's the harbor, there's Staten Island, there's 
Brooklyn back here. And that corner I was just showing you is right here. And so if we zoom in, you can see museum. You can't see that it says American Museum. So that is, uh, that is Barnum's headquarters. He purchased the building in 1841 from Scudder's. Um, if, uh, I mean, you probably know all, all about P.T. Barnum. Uh, there's a sucker born every minute. He never said that. That's uh, apocryphal. Um, but he said many things that are the equivalent of that. Uh, the American Museum had you know, like a special room where you went in to see the cherry-colored cat. And then when the, the curtain went up, it turned out to be a black cat because it was the color of a black cherry. And he had signs that say, this way to see the egress. And then you would follow all the signs to see the egress. And that, that just means exit, and you'd be out on the street. Um, so while he may have never said there's a sucker born every minute, he certainly uh, knew it deep in his heart. And if you look at the museum, you can see that the museum had everything going for it, but the big thing that it's advertising here is an exhibition of the balloon panorama this afternoon and evening. Um, this was obviously their big draw, and you can see actually here in the print, there is the balloon. This is an ad that I found from the 1840s, so you can see there is also by special desire the magnificent balloon panorama of the great city of london uh, they had wax figures of the murdered officers and crew of the amistad they had a theater inside where the ethiopian serenaders that was a minstrel show would perform they had santa anna's wooden leg this has become the subject of great controversy recently uh who should own santa anna's wooden leg but Barnum had it. Uh, but the panorama was the draw. This is not it. There do not appear to be any extant records of what the panorama of the great city of London actually looked like. This is a panorama of the Gardens of Versailles, which you can go visit at the Metropolitan Museum. And this was on view in a custom-built uh, rotunda, which stood in City Hall Park, just about a block north of the American Museum. And it just goes to show how in the era before film and television, and when a lot of people were not literate, um, places like Barnum's American Museum really provided an incredible um, array, for lack of a better term, of things from the, the highly moralistic and educational to the outright frauds, like the Fiji mermaid, which was supposedly the skeleton of a mermaid, and it was just something that they had put together. But anyway, these panoramas uh, were, were quite um, popular from the very tail end of the 18th century through about the Civil War. Now, next to Barnum's museum, two doors down, was G-E-N-I-N -N, Hatters. I don't know if he is Genin or Genin. Um, and I found a guide to the Eno collection, which is now in the New York uh, Public Library, which was a collection of city views. And when it was donated to the library in 1925, this book was written. And I found it very interesting that the three things that it pointed out in this print that we're looking at today were this hattery, uh, because Genin, Genin, we'll call him Genin, um, was the first person in 1850 to stand in line and buy a ticket to see Jenny Lind at Castle Garden. He paid $225 to see her. Uh, and I looked it up, and that is give or take about $9,000 today. Uh, and she, if you don't know, was very famously promoted by P.T. Barnum. She was the Swedish Nightingale. She was an absolute sensation. Uh, sold out concerts down in Battery Park at Castle Garden. Well, Jenin was the first person to buy a ticket. He, in turn, then had exclusive rights to sell Jenny Lind riding hats from his store. And hopefully he, he thought it was a sound investment. So this list of things to look for in this print are to remind you of him. He was obviously quite a character, uh, and we'll come back to him. To remind you that Fulton Street used to be the home of Dunnigan's Cheap Cash Bookstore, or what appears to be Dunnigan's Hemp Cash Bookstore. No, it's Dunnigan's Cheap Cash Bookstore, uh, which was clearly a destination in Lower Manhattan. And that from the steeple of St. Paul's in this print, you could see Brady's Daguerrean Miniature Gallery. Now, in 1849, when this print was being made, uh, Matthew Brady was still making a name for himself. It was, it was a popular 
uh, store. You can see the ad there for Brady's Gallery, Portrait and Family Groups, uh, and there is St. Paul's, and there is Brady's in the building there. But it would only be with the Civil War that he became uh, so famous. And now, of course, with the retrospective history, we look back and we think of Matthew Brady as the sort of cat's meow of daguerreotype photographers of this century. Um, but he was just one of many up-and-coming photographers at the time. So Barnum, Jenin, Brady. Um, I love the details in this. If you zoom in above Brady, there's a woman hanging out the sheets uh, of this window. If you go just a little bit beyond her, there's laundry hanging to dry on the roof of a house, uh, which I think is fantastic. It's these details that, that make this print so alive. Down the street from Brady's, uh, this is Fulton Street, um, we get a couple of these low-rise buildings. And then, uh, this just tickles my fancy, this building is a cabinet furniture warehouse. And this building is furniture wear rooms. And so I had to look this up. What's the difference between a warehouse, a word we all use, and wear rooms, a word we do not. And it just designates mixed use. Um, if the building had other things going on in it, like manufacture, uh, and some rooms for storage, well, then they were wear rooms. But if the whole building was given over to storage, uh, then it was a warehouse. Zoom back out again, and, uh, you know, as with all of these balloon, steeple, uh, aerial bird's eye views, there's obviously great detail in the foreground, and then as we move towards the vanishing point of the picture, uh, the details get less and less, but that doesn't mean you can't pick out some notable things. This is the Middle Dutch Church, which was on Nassau Street. This is the Dome of the Merchants Exchange. This is Governor's Island, and there quite clearly you can see Castle William, which was built for the War of 1812, and of course dominating the Lower Manhattan skyline, the tallest building in New York City at the time, the steeple of Trinity Church, Wall Street. So that's 1849, just to give you a quick overview. And this is 1855, and uh, at first glance, Maybe you don't notice that there are changes, but one thing that's happened is that the other one cuts off at Barnum's Museum, and this print includes Ann Street and a lot more of the city in that direction. So while this is not a separate, considered a separate painting, uh, the print is much wider in its scope. And as you began to look, as you begin to look, you can see that they've clearly updated the buildings that had changed. So this is that same view I just showed you, the steeples, Governor's Island in the middle. And here it is six years later, Middle Dutch Church, Trinity Church, Merchant Exchange, Castle William, and that smokestack, which does not appear to have existed. Uh, in 1855, the same year as that print, this is an engraving that appeared in the London Illustrated News, Merchants Exchange, Trinity, in between them, no smokestack. This is a Bachman view, this engraving, uh, also from the late 1850s, uh, Trinity Church, Merchants Exchange, no smokestack. Not to belabor this point, but here's a photograph from 1860 looking from uh, the East River towards Trinity Church. Yeah, there's a little thing over there, but that's just, that's not a smokestack. So why is it there? I would love to know. It does not appear to have been real. And and, and I guess the, 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 the lesson here is that in any painting or drawing or print, they can make it look however they want it to look. And somebody wanted a smokestack. Here's our ware rooms and our warehouse. And when we zip forward six years, well, first of all, these two low-rise buildings are now replaced by a much larger uh, building that has Lewis and Jones, Woods and Lowry, which I think were two different stores, but it's clearly uh, all one building. And where the ware rooms and the warehouse once stood, now we have hosiery, 
white goods and laces, embroideries. This is plain and fancy paper boxes. So the nature of commerce in the neighborhood has changed. There's our woman with her sheet. There's our laundry. Uh, in 1849, and in 1855, the laundry's still there, because those buildings still existed, uh, but the poor woman hanging her sheets out the window is gone, because new buildings had gone up on Broadway, and so this print needed to reflect that. And it's a little hard to read, but that says Joseph Orvis. And this is even harder to read, but this is the block south of Fulton Street. So there's the Orvis building uh, that you can see the top of in the steeple view. And the other thing that's interesting to note is this now says power printing presses. Brady Studio, by the time this print is made in the mid to late 1860s, is now uptown. Uh, so constant flux, constant change. If there's one hallmark of New York City, that's it. Back across the street, Dunnigan's Cheap Cash Bookstore, the Hattery, the Museum. And notice this building here, this red three-story dormered windows. Uh, looks like it could have been a house once upon a time, probably commercial in the 1840s. Now just completely subsumed into Barnum's Museum, which has expanded either reclad or torn down that building. Uh, Jennings hats and caps and umbrellas are still here. Uh, next to him, where there was a one-story cigar merchant, is now another hatter named Knox. Uh, and just around this time, 1855, Jennings starts to uh, make noises about how there should be a bridge over Broadway at this intersection. This has become the busiest intersection in New York City at this time. So why is there a, a print in 1855 from the steeple of, of St. Paul's? Because you are in the absolute heart of New York City. Union Square is going to wrestle this away soon, but it hasn't happened yet. So traffic was so bad in New York City at this time uh, that they want to put a bridge over. And it doesn't happen in the 1850s. You can see the Hatter there. It does happen. Oh, sorry. Here's bad traffic. So there's Barnum's Museum. And this is winter traffic on Broadway. And you can see all of the horses rearing up and all of the sleds coming together and all the pedestrians trying to figure out what to do. It's just a total cacophony. Uh, so in 1866, Jenin finally gets his wish, and he gets a very short-lived bridge over Broadway here. And it was Knox, his next-door hatter, that evidently was the undoing of it, because the bridge brought you across and down and straight into the front door of his rival, his next-door neighbor and rival, and Knox couldn't evidently stand this. So um, I pointed this out. There's the red building. There's Barnum. And again... Notice that now the print gives us the north side of Ann Street. So they've they've taken the time to have somebody engrave all of these new buildings and to show uh, Barnum's Museum. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the balloon panorama is long gone at this point. Uh, but notice they still have the balloon illustration here, uh, which is left over from the original print. I thought that was interesting. Here's another view of Barnum uh, and the Hatter. You can see them both next door. This is uh, looking uh, at the front door of Barnum's American Museum. Here's a photograph of the same uh, from, uh, I forget what year this photo was taken, but uh, approximately 1865, which is the year that it burned down. Spectacular fire in 1865, started in an office downstairs, quickly spread to the entire museum. And uh, Barnum did rebuild, but the second museum also caught fire in 1868, and maybe he decided at that point it was time to cut his losses. Um, and even though F. Scott Fitzgerald said there are no second acts in American life, Barnum, of course, went on to, you know, promote the circus and join forces with Ringling Brothers, and now there's Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and Animal Crackers, and the name Barnum shall live forever. So there's not only second acts, there's third, fourth, and fifth acts for P.T. Barnum, including that horrible movie. We won't talk about that. So that was just a very quick uh, 
foray into these prints. I can pull them up if people have questions. I would be happy to answer. Someone asked the question uh, about the, the links to all three talks. I would be happy to. These, these talks, as you know, are free of charge, uh, and they are available on both um, Vimeo and YouTube. And so when I send the email out tomorrow uh, with this link, I will link to all three. Um, and uh, look forward to part four sometime in the summer. Uh, I think I'm going to talk about um, the harbor. There's so many brilliant prints in the uh, at Arator Galleries. So Arator Galleries is up at 1018 Madison Avenue, right near the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and now that you've like heard about these prints, uh, it would be fantastic if you are in New York City uh, to go take a look at them. Um, because the the I the level of detail I could only pick so many things to talk about. There's so many more things to look about, look at in these prints. Um, someone asked about the history of awnings. Um, I'm going to answer that. And I'm going to I'm going to pull up a, a slide. So just while I'm still on this slide, uh, just to let you know, I I give a couple of talks a month. Uh, usually charge a, a fee, a nominal fee for them. Uh, on Thursday, May twelfth. Um, I'm going to be doing a talk about Madison Square, Union Square, Stuyvesant Square, and Gramercy Park, um, which is essentially the city, people in the city rebelling against the absolute gridiron Cartesian regularity of the map that had been imposed on Manhattan, which included basically no parks, no squares, no open public space. So we're going to talk about, again, exact same era that we're talking about today, uh, so that's on Thursday, May 12th, and you can register at walknyc.com. Uh, if you did not come to the presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago about the Gilded Age, the TV show, and the era, um, it is uh, there's an encore version of that, which I'm doing in conjunction with the New York Historical Society. So if you go to nyhistory.org and click on Programs, you can sign up for that is a very fun, breezy what parts of the Gilded Age TV show were true, which part were fiction, and you know where do the where do the two meet? So, I would highly recommend if you are interested in that to join me on May seventeenth. That one's a little later, so that we can better accommodate some West Coast folks. So, uh, someone asked about awnings, and I want to go back to uh, is it well? This slide shows some nice street awnings, but I thought that. Um, let's see if I can find, let's just go up to this one. So yeah, uh, I, I can't zoom in on this because I don't have the zoom, but if you see here, that is an awning that is a giant advertisement for the store. It, some of this is true and some of this is false. Awnings in the era before air conditioning were incredibly important in order to block the afternoon sun especially. And it can be kind of disconcerting sometimes when you're looking at photographs, daguerreotypes and et cetera of the 19th century to see even like incredibly elegant townhouses uh, having awnings over the front windows. Um, but if your house was situated in such a way that you got a lot of uh, sunlight, uh, awnings for a number of people were key. Now, the reason, I didn't include this one as I couldn't find out if it was real. It's an advertisement for the business that was there. It seems like a clever way to advertise, but I don't think it was, I don't think it actually happened that way. Uh, and I read, a, I read an essay about how these prints sometimes themselves acted as advertisements. And it makes me wonder, like, were they sponsored? Uh, did they, did they try to figure out a way to get an ad for their store? on an awning in this print, trying to make it look naturalistic uh, when it wasn't there. But I could not find any evidence of that awning with that ad actually existing. Who paid for the painting? Well, I'm assuming, and I don't know, I'm, let me see if Mike's here. I was hoping that Michael Foley from, there he is. Um, I know that the prints themselves generated income for the printmakers. But I don't know if the printmakers, in turn, were the people who uh, commissioned the paintings uh, and paid for them. The answer is it happened a lot of different ways. Uh, with respect to this particular 
uh, print, the, the artist Hill, who was an English-born artist, was himself also an engraver. And he was very close to the engraving community here in New York. He was a New Yorker, uh, ultimately passed away up in uh, Nyack. But uh, he would have been paid by the Meagley Printing Company in order to produce the first state of this, of this engraving. Uh, the subsequent state, uh, the copper plate was obviously purchased by a different company, a very large lithography company called Lang, or Prang, I'm sorry. And uh, so they would have, having purchased the copper plate uh, for the engraving, would have been free to make any changes that they wanted to make without having to, to repay the artist. Someone asks whether the uh, 1855 one was to um, fulfill demand uh, after the 1841 one was 1849 one was so popular. Do you know the answer to that question? I don't, but I think it's an astute question. The answer is likely yes. Uh, the period the, during this period there was a tremendous growth in interest in in city views and and New York being the most important. Uh, Everyone really wanted them. And in addition to that, the merchants who were proliferating throughout uh, Manhattan, this area particularly, they all wanted these things to be popular. This was a way to get their names out in front of the public and, and their potential customers. So, yeah, there was a lot of demand for these. Great, thank you. Um, the next, the follow-up question is, wa when was the Great Fire? So there were two fires in Lower Manhattan. Uh, one was in 1835 and one was in 1845. Uh, the, and of course there was one in, in, during the Revolution. Only the one during the Revolution actually got this far north. Um, so both the 1835 fire, uh, which was essentially contained below Wall Street, and the 1845 fire, which was even smaller, would not have affected these buildings. But there was, in the wake of these two fires, a building boom in Lower Manhattan. So certainly one could argue that some of these buildings went up because suddenly, I mean, pardon the pun, but Lower Manhattan was the hot place to be. So, um, this was, uh, someone's, uh, sending us a picture of the Great Fire of 1845. There are a lot of great, so, prints were high, city views were highly in demand. Uh, city views, views of events, uh, were extremely popular. Uh, and so, like I just showed you very briefly at the end there, a print of Barnum's Museum on fire. Uh, that's the sort of thing that people wanted in the, again, in the, in an era without, um, photography, uh, that wasn't portrait photography, uh, and television, radio, motion pictures, you name it. Uh, prints like this were often extremely popular for commemorating events. Someone asks, how long would it take to produce this print? I'm going to ask you to unmute, Mike. Uh, yeah, the the engraving process was it could be quite lengthy. It's obviously a very complicated uh, process to take an original work of art, engrave it in copper in reverse, because when your print comes off of the copper, the, the image has to be positive and match the original. It was an art form that was uh, uh, very prevalent, and there were a lot of people practicing it. So. You had, if you're a publisher and you want to make a print, you've got your choice of a lot of talented people who can do that work for you. But nonetheless, it was very, very time consuming. Once the plate is created, however, the, the production of the of black and white prints happens very quickly, as you might expect. They're just, they come off of a printing press. And once they're dry, they would be individually hand colored. Uh, the colorists, uh, it varied a little bit, but the typical arrangement would have been a number of col uh, colorists all sitting in the same place and each one responsible some, for some portion of the print. And they would pass it along and there'd be a, a guide uh, in front of them that they would use as, as a guide to printing them. So even within the same run, there are individual variations among the, among the prints, uh, but they strove and, and fairly successfully to make them all the same. 
do you happen to know how large either of these runs was in terms of how many were printed? I don't, and uh, I don't even know if that if that information is out there. I've done a fair amount of reading on, on this particular plate, but I haven't yet run across that piece of information. As a general rule, uh, a copper plate engraving begins to lose its, uh, its definition after uh, a run of about 3,000 uh, know, uh, reproductions. And if someone were to do a census, you could study the existing copies and see whether there's any significant degradation in the in the image, and if there isn't, that means the total run would have been under that number. But uh, there just aren't any records I've been able to find on that. Again, thanks to Raider Galleries. Thank you to all of you for coming. I know I've kept you a little longer than I promised, but I do appreciate all the questions and all the interest. And as I said, please go up to uh, Madison Avenue if you have an opportunity and check these out. Oh, one more question. How much, uh, I'm going to, since Mike is still here, I'm going to ask, how much did these prints go for when they were new? I don't know exactly in, in, uh, in the then current uh, price uh, uh, currency, but a print like this would have been the equivalent today of uh, probably uh, $500, $400, something like that. It's, it would be substantial enough that it required a certain investment on the part of someone who wanted it, uh, but it was inexpensive enough that a broad number of people could afford to buy it. Great. Well, if if two uh, if two hundred and twenty five dollars in eighteen fifty was about nine thousand dollars today, uh, so twenty two fifty would have been about. Um, nine hundred dollars uh so maybe 10 or 11 bucks uh at that time um which is a substantial amount of money uh, I, I make this point all the time that uh day laborers in uh new york city often could not expect to make more than 60 cents a day and they couldn't necessarily expect to work a full five days a week uh and so if even if you made as much as a dollar a day and you were employed 20 days out of the month uh you're st still only a 20 dollar a month paycheck so if this was a 10 dollar uh print that would have been half of a sort of average working stiffs monthly salary so i think that's a great place for us to end i thank all of you for coming and uh we will definitely see you next time thanks so much